All right, I've got 10 after, so we're going to go ahead and start. Um, if you're in the back and you can't see the text, consider in the future moving forward. In fact, you can still do that. I don't mind. There's seat, 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 two seats here, one seat here, one, 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 one. So there's a few that are closer. Now, I can like make the text bigger, uh, and I'm going to be showing an awful lot of text generally through the course, so not necessarily today. but you know, I, th I do think if, like, if vision is an issue in this class, you do want to try to move forward. As the class goes on, uh, and this just kind of happens at U of T, unfortunately, for whatever reason, fewer and fewer students attend. So like, it will become the case that probably like half of the auditorium will be full. So it will be very easy to kind of move forward. And I would encourage you to do that, because I'm going to be doing a lot of live coding um, eventually. Um, let's see. I had, I had started chatting with kind of a group of students that were kind of early. That was like, like if I make like a crescent moon here, like up to like these pillars, like kind of, I don't know, like kind of like a, just like a moon shape type of thing. And I was just generally talking about like computers. And I was saying, oh, I have a Mac and it has a long battery life and that's really great. Um, the reason I like Mac is because if you're a real tech, a real computer person, then you are doing command line stuff all the time. So I mean, let's say you're a data scientist in industry and you're like working on production pipelines or something, you'll be working in a terminal kind of situation. And just for fun, I wanted to show people what the terminal is. So there it is, that's my favorite button in Mac. And I hit that and you're in some kind of situation like this. Now what I actually happen to be doing here is I happen to be running a local notebook server. Oh, my mom said hi. A local notebook server. Uh, Oh, I have a lot of these time limit things. The modern world is constantly trying to sell you stuff and it can like really distract you and so on. Um, watch out for that. Like there's a lot of things that demand your attention and if you start getting hooked and addicted on social media, it's just gonna make your studies very, very hard. So I actually like I do this like every time I wanna go to a new website, every single day it tells me like, are you sure? And of course, I'm going to click yes. I want to go look at my notebook because I want to do my work. But it, like, it's a good constant reminder for me. So actually, I like these kind of apps and like setting up your computer this way. Uh, like if you think about motivation from a psychological perspective, if you have more interesting things to do than say the work that you should be doing, you'll do the more interesting things. All the while beating yourself up emotionally, it'll be like struggling, like, oh, I should work, but there's other more interesting things to do. So truly, I know you're young and you want to have fun, so definitely do that. But like the way to stay strongly motivated is to not have too much other tempting stuff. Just, I don't know, just because this kind of popped up. So I can ignore this limit for today, which is what I do. I click this button a lot. That's kind of annoying, but it, it puts me in the right frame of mind. Like I know I don't want to get distracted with stuff. I want to stay productive and so on. This is a local notebook. Um, here I'm just doing something called like Markdown and inside of Markdown I have LaTeX. I'll show you that a little bit more when we get to the syllabus. Um, I'm not doing any heavy coding, although I might. This is doing some Bayesian analysis stuff eventually, so I might eventually want to do some coding on my computer. That's basically the only reason I would want a big heavy computer. Otherwise, the only thing a computer for is a terminal into a more powerful computing device. So that's what we'll be doing in our class. So it's nice if you have like a good computer. Uh, it's nice if you have long battery. All your computer is for is just flying through the web to get to cloud services. And that is really how we work these days. You don't need a powerful kind of local computer. So I do have a computer that can do something locally here. Um, and when I do that, I go into terminal and then I launch whatever kind of local server I want. Um, but this environment that we're looking at is going to look exactly like the environment that you're going to be working on, which is the U of T Jupyter Hub. So I just bring this up only to just contrast. You can have these local environments, but that's not really the way we work these days. In fact, most of my work is not done locally. Most of my work is done up in the cloud through like U of T Jupyter Hub, which is what we'll be using. Before we get to U of T Jupyter Hub, though, um, so that's kind of local stuff, local computing. But let me open up a new private window. Let me try to find U of T Quirkus. I want to like just fully go through all these steps. So hopefully everybody has navigated to the course homepage. So if you have, then sorry, I'm just like going to go super slow here. Okay, so even though this is a private window, it, su it does seem to remember me. So I was able to just have my username and my login. 
that's nice because my password's like 21 characters and they're hard, so like I mess it up a lot. So it is nice to have like this kind of like safe password stuff. Okay, so I'm landing on Quirkus. Oh yeah, I remember these classrooms are always so hard to uh, like get internet connectivity. That's relatively fast. So I don't actually know what Quirkus looks like for students, but maybe something like this, and maybe you have your courses. And so the most important landing page for us is our course. So stat 130, fall 2023. So I'll click in there and I'll try to get there. Now that's gonna take us to like, what is the home page? And it's got this stuff on the right, which maybe is useful. Like it's got this like uh, calendar updates and like what's due. But when I actually made this web page, I want more width, I don't want this here. So if you want a wider view, you can go to pages and what that will load. Since this is taking kind of a long time, let me just go to where it's already loaded here for a second and we'll see if it loads in the meantime. That will kind of make it wider, if you see what I mean. Like, it doesn't bother with all this stuff on the right, which is kind of superfluous as far as my, for my purposes. So pages is actually like what our landing page looks like. And if you like click on any like link in the syllabus to the course homepage on Quirkus, it takes you to pages. Hello, Ivan. Ivan, actually, I was hoping if you would just kind of kick us off. It's a totally oh, good time here. Is it okay? Sure. Yeah, come on up. So um, Ivan is our STAT 130 Mentorship Program Coordinator. Um, here to welcome you, orient you to the, the mentorship program. Um, and um, there are points in the course associated with that. So maybe you'll describe that a little bit. No, it's perfect timing, actually. This is right when I wanted you to jump in. And what I'm going to do is just disconnect and then... For sure. Okay. Like, are you good? <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. Same for me. And does that work for your computer? Yes. Brilliant. And then can I actually have you put on the microphone because it's, I've got the OCCS recording happening. I don't know how you want to do it. I, just I think it's working. Well. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, oh, this, this is what I want to do. I want to do like this, queer this, and then I'll slowly start kind of doing the rest of the intro to the course. When I write my syllabus, I always am very conflicted if I want to put the mentorship thing right at the top, and, mm -hmm. and sometimes I often do, because I really like to emphasize that arriving to university, of course there's all the academic stuff, but you know the way you're really going to succeed is if you start to feel like you belong because that's going to just be the foundation for everything. If you're feeling good about like the friends that you make and the routines that you have, all the coursework is going to follow. You're going to be able to do it well. Um, and that's what the mentorship program, I think, is all about, trying to facilitate having you guys make connections. So I was really pleased to hear all the talking, people talking with their neighbors. I know you want to be polite, and you don't want to like intrude on people's spaces, and you don't want to like, be that, like, cringy, awkward person being like, hey, I don't know you. But you know, right now, while it's the beginning of classes, I think it's okay to do it. Just be like, hey, what classes are you taking? And I think it's like pretty common casual to start kind of making some friends and connections. Yeah. But with that, Ivan. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Scott, for inviting me um, to come and talk to you folks for your first day. First and foremost, welcome to the University of Toronto and congratulations to getting to accept it to U of T. Um, we're really, really, ex really excited to have you here with us. Um, we're really lucky, um, like Scott already said, you're in your first year, some of you are in your second year, but university is more than just getting a 4.0 and just more than just, you know, um, getting your experience here, but it's also about meeting the people, meeting new friends, ma making connection with folks. So we're really lucky to have the mentorship program built into the STAT 130 course syllabus. Um, we hope that you know by participating in this program, um, you get a 3% through your final grade. It might not be a lot, but it can also sometimes be a letter grade difference. So we hope this kind of little incentive will be a nice way for you to um, reach out to participate in some of the mentorship program um, that we have here. Uh, we, the, the way that we're designing the program really helping to help, um, to help you transition from not only from high school to university, but a lot of you, many of you are also international students. You're new to Canada, you're new to Toronto. So we hope that this program will helping you to kind of connecting with upper year students as well as your classmate who's, you know, also on the same boat, but also, you know, in uh, 
who's domestic student who can kind of share that resources and that network um, among yourself. So a lot of the information is already on Quarkus. Um, you're all going to get access to a SharePoint page where all of the information regarding the mentorship program as well as the mentor biographies, how to book an appointment with them, some of the events including both social and personal development events and career exploration events are going to be available on the SharePoint page for you folks. Um, you're all going to have access to it by the end of the day, which is waiting for the final um, class list. And then after that, if you do not have access to them um, by the end of the day today, if you're checking it tomorrow, please wait after the at deadline, September 20th. After that, once the classes is completely finalized, there's no movement, we'll do another ad thing, everyone. So after that, you all should get access to it if you are in the class. Um, yeah, we, so we, the way that we're dividing the program, we divide it into three main pillars. The first one is career exploration development. So for this particular event, we're partnering with career, ex, um, career exploration and education center. Um, we'll talk about you know, how to develop in your resume, your cover letter, what can you do with a degree in STAT, um, learning about you know, where is it that you want to move forward within the next few years of your of your time here at the university. The second point is you know, the social and personal development, like Scott already said, it's about building a network, building a community. You're all in your first year, so I think this is a really great time for you to meet other people who are going through the same experience with you as well. Um, last year, we have a bunch of different events for you folks to participate. We had a virtual workout section, we have Canvas tour, we had uh, games night, um, it's just kind of like an a informal way for you to come out and meet other people. And we always have free food there, so you get meeting people, you got free food, and you also got a point in your, um, in, for your class. So I think there's a no-brainer for you to participate. And the third point is a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the mentors. We have 22 different mentors from all over different programs. We have folks from Rotman, from Biostatistics, from econ, from computer science, data science. Um, we're trying to diversify the background of our, of our mentors. So if you have, go, you have the opportunity to go through all the, the mentor biography, and if there's a, a person that you would like to connect with, feel free to reach out and book an appointment with them. Um, all of the appointment will be, the meeting will be happen online via Microsoft Teams. Um, you'll have no kind of how to use Microsoft Teams. Sure. That would be, um, it's really straightforward. Once you book an appointment, you get a confirmation email into your Outlook calendar, and then there's an automatic uh, generate uh, link for the meetings or to the day of the meeting. You just need to click on it to join that conversation with the mentor. And after that reflection, um, in order for us to know how if you already completed the, the requirements, you will have to submit a reflection on Quarkus after your meeting with the mentor, your, uh, after your participation with the events, both for career and for the social and personal development. Um, we have some of the guiding questions on, the, on Quarkus. So once you get onto it, you can kind of take a look at some of the questions and kind of answer through them. Um, we just want you to, to give you the opportunity to reflecting on your, your experience after attending some of the events. Um, tell us if you like it, if you didn't like it, what can we do better for, um, you know, to better your experience in the future. And I think that's pretty much it. So again, I just want to reiterate, why is it that you want to be participating in this program? Um, we, we just want to, you know, providing you with the opportunity to build a community. We've been saying a lot of the term community is like throwing it around a lot, but as you already, may, you might not know, but you know, U of T is such a big um, campus, so sometimes it can feel a little bit isolated. So we hope that, you know, this program by participating, by coming out to some of our events, you get a chance to meet some of your classmates, some of the upper, upper year students and uh, build your connection from there. And yeah, and aside from that, you get a chance to earn your 3% toward your final grade. Um, like I said, some of you might not think it's important, but it can be a letter grade difference. So I hope to see you at some of the events in the future. Um, and if you have any questions, please check your Quarkus site or send an email to stat130 at utoronto.ca with the mentorship headlines, and I'll be able to answer them.
much. Thank you so much, Ivan. Um, yeah, I mean. Are there any questions so far that maybe I can answer right now? Questions for Ivan. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's not mandatory, but the maximum grade that you could have then would be a 97 in the course yeah. if you didn't do them. Um, and yeah, it could be a letter grade, um, but it definitely is like a plus minus type of thing. I mean, most of the plus minus windows on top of your letter grade are in the realm of like three points sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's more of a share of experience. Okay, so no matter what I answer, just that. Yeah, so there's no right and wrong answer. I mean, if you can just, there's some of the, the guided questions pretty lay, uh, pretty clearly on, on, on the project ass assignments. So kind of go through in that, just reflecting on your experience there. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Another question here. Uh, it's 3%, that was uh, from a previous semester, it's 3%. Yeah, that was my fault, actually. I changed it to 5% last time, but we're back to 3%. Actually, we're back to 3% for your benefit. You might feel like, hey, I like 5% of events. But no, it starts, the semester gets very busy, and students actually started feeling like, oh my god, I have to do so many of these mentorship types of things. Yes? So each of, like you technically only need to attend one personal development event, one career exploration event, and one meeting with the uh, mentor. So three events, for sure. yeah, 40%, yeah. Just for the record before, I'll come to more questions, but just for the record, um, the, the initial question, just so I can get it on the microphone and the recording, um, so these are not exactly marked. It's more of a reflection. It's more of a personal activity. But Ivan is reading them, and that's informing your sense of the mentorship program and so on, right? Yeah. Generally, we do have a lot of uh, writing assignments in this course, very similar to reflections, but they're going to be about answering questions, describing statistical methodology, and so on. W once again, I just take this opportunity to describe this. Like Once again, the, the marking is not about, we're not an English class but we are about having effective communication. So ideally, you know, if the communication is struggling, um, if the English is struggling, hopefully you'll be getting some feedback to that effect, and hopefully it's not affecting the mark uh, too much. This class should be an opportunity to practice your communication, especially your written communication. There are quite a few more questions here. Can I actually have you yeah, take yeah, that again, just so that if there's any relevant questions. Yeah. There was a question here, and then we'll come there. For sure. He had his hand up earlier. Yeah, I know you said you have to attend one personal development, one mentorship, et cetera, but if you want, you can attend how many of our mentor one-on-one -on -one meetings, right? Yes, we, yeah, if you have, um, if you want to book more appointment, more than once or more, like if there's multiple people that you want to talk to, feel free to book an appointment with them, as long as they're available. Yeah. And could you describe one more time? Oh, yeah, let's go to the question here. That's right. Well, could you describe one more time, Ivan? So there's like the three different pillars, mm -hmm. and you, each one is worth one point. And then yes. That's, yeah. Yeah. And then that's it. But so the, again, so there's three main pillars: career exploration, social and personal development, and an upper one-on-one -on -one, uh, meeting with the mentor. But if you folks, you know, wanted to participate more, wanted to talk more than just one of the mentor, feel free to do that. Like we, we not. That, that's the minimum, but there's no maximum. So if you want to continue coming to the events, want to meet more people, you're more than welcome to do so. Yeah. So do you write three reflections for each? Yes, there's three reflections for each. Yes. Yes. So the due date for all the reflection is December 7th. I would encourage you, you know, after you're meeting with a mentor, after you attend the event, just submit your reflection right away so you don't have to wait until the end of the semester when things are getting a, little, a lot easier. Yeah. Do you have a question in the back? It's not all the events. So we're going to... Aside from the events that our mentor team is going to host, we are going also to um, promoting other events across campus. So if you are at your college, in your residence, if there's an event, um, 
you know, by all means, you can participate, participate in those events and submit your reflection based on that as well. So the whole idea is about encouraging you to step out of your classroom and gaining that experience, that community. So you don't need to just participating in the events that we host. Um, you can also participating in you know, events at your residence hall, at your college. Um, if you're part of a student club on campus, you can also do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I see that uh, this meeting has a very long time, I mean, like from 9 to 8 a.m. to almost uh, 5 p.m., 4 p.m. in the afternoon. So I think it's too long. Well, we need to be in that meeting for so, so long. I don't know just, uh, well, if you are attending an event, so I'm encouraging you to stay for the, the, the whole entire time. Uh, if you have to leave, that's fine. Um, a lot of the events that we are hosting will kind of run about one hour, one and a half hour. So it's a lot more manageable for you folks. Um, if you cannot attend the events in the next, like this week or next week, you're more than welcome to attend other events that we are going to promote later on. And let me just comment because yeah. I'm familiar with that one. Yeah, so that's like a whole academic, uh, almost a conference, like a big, big session. Um, it is relevant and interesting for the course, but probably not all of it would be. I don't know if we'll get scheduling information, but if we do, we can send it out. But I think we would ex be expecting events that you would go to to take about an hour of your time. So you would not be expected to go nine to five or, or whatever that is. Ideally, uh, you could find maybe a couple presentations at that event that you were interested in over the span of an hour and attend that. But even that's not necessary. If you were to just drop in for an hour and say, hey, I checked out this conference. This is basically what was happening. I saw this. I saw that. That's OK as well. But yeah, you're right about that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple questions here. Yes, we will uh, using Corcus site to promoting those events. And like I said, you also have access to all the SharePoint page. There should be a hyperlink on Corcus right now, but you don't have access to that. I'll add everyone in uh, by the end of the day today. Yeah. Um, there's some some of the um, the guidelines on Corcus. So what I'm basically just kind of answer some of the guiding questions over there. Um, there's no right or wrong, but also. I think the minimum word count is about 200 to 400 words. We don't want you to spend a lot of time, but we don't also don't want you to send like a one sentence kind of reflection in either. <laughs> okay. Going once, going twice, sold. <laughs> sold. Thank you very much, Ivan. Easy. Yeah, absolutely. Easy, easy points. So all events will be advertised through certainly the SharePoint site that you probably don't have access to right now, but you'll be getting access very soon. Um, ideally, we'll be making the announcements through Quirkus as well related to this question over here. It's possible that like, maybe we won't get to make an announcement, but for the most part, I don't think we'll have a problem as well reminding you of these kinds of things. Also, as Ivan said, and just to emphasize, if you have an event on campus, which you think about and you say, this seems like it would be appropriate as kind of a campus activity, a mentorship style event, and fits within those two pillars, the kind of like the professional, uh, social, those pillars, the two pillars of the three, you can do that event too. It doesn't have to be like sanctioned through us. If you'd like to confirm, you can email the course uh, email and Ivan will be able to see that. And last time many students had requests for what about this event? What about that event? And it seemed basically Ivan was like, yeah, yeah, these are great. These are all great. All right, let's get this back up. So I did decide to put this front and foremost, but the mentorship is a, a very, kind of like consistent part of what our course is. So down here, all you gotta do is just scroll down a little bit and there's a cool little video um, that Ivan and the other mentors and the people involved in that program put together. It's like four minutes. I would encourage you to go ahead and have a look. It should actually be a little bit motivating and kind of fun. Um, 
when you come to a, a great place like U of T, and there's also not so great things about U of T, but the great parts you should engage and enjoy and take part of. And so like, you know, watch that video to see the very positive side, um, which hopefully will be more of what your experience here is. Um, I wanna maybe on a very similar note, go ahead and jump down right here. There are RSGs. Okay, please put your hands up if you've heard of RSGs. And don't be shy, we can't be shy, let's get hands up. So it's actually not even half the class apparently that's heard of RSGs. So these are registered study groups. You can register to lead a study group. It's something like five to eight students all together, I'm not sure. And you just set up times to study together. The way to succeed in life is to persist and have routine. You, you, you always keep working because the more you work, the more experience you accumulate, the better you get. So you stop growing as soon as you stop trying. So you, the key is just to persist. I have a, I'm 40 years old, I have a good amount of experience in the world. What I see through the people that I have observed in my life is it's not the smartest people that succeed, it's the people that try at it the longest. So as long as you want something long enough and you keep working for it, you persist, you will eventually get to where a place that you're pretty happy with. Um, and the way to persist is to set up a good routine. This goes back to the motivation thing. You gotta have the times that you know you're gonna do the work and that you go and you do the work. And so these study groups are really excellent for that. And also you get that peer synergy. You know, if you've got a bunch of good working friends around you, you're yourself gonna become a pretty good worker. You won't be able to help it. That's just a natural peer pressure that's gonna happen. There's another thing uh, very similar called Meet to Complete, which is like, I think it's an online drop-in that's happened at scheduled times. I don't think they actually have the scheduled times for that right now, but I do have a link here. Um, that's the second bullet point below the picture for the RSG. It's a big long link, it says Sydney Smith something, something, something. Um, these are, this is meet to complete. Uh, it's another place to have a regular routine where you go to do some work and get some work done. You could also just do this informally with your friends. You could make a bit of a deal, a bit of a contract with your classmates and say, okay, this is the day, this is the, the time window. This is when we get together and we do our work. You, you want to do this because it's going to make your work easier if you have more people kind of collaborating and working together. Um, and also sometimes you're not gonna wanna do the work, but you probably be up for seeing your friend because that'd probably be fun, you know? So make work fun by working together. Uh, you shouldn't be copy pasting sharing code. That would just be plagiarism because that would be presenting work that was not your own as though it was your own. But speaking with your friend about, I don't understand this problem. Can you describe to me what you're doing to try to solve this problem? And they should say something like, okay, I'm doing this kind of coding. I don't wanna tell you exactly what I'm doing, but let me roughly describe to you what the code is trying to do. That's a, that's a totally fine conversation. I mean, if you came here to copy paste answers, like I, I probably you won't make it through U of T, but anyway, you're definitely not gonna get out anything out of U of T and you're gonna be paying a lot of money for like one of the most expensive universities to copy paste. So I don't know, if that's your plan, if you came to pay a lot of money to copy paste, I guess more power to you. If you actually want to learn, you've got to do the work yourself. You can't get, you, there's no shortcuts here, especially in coding, for example. We're going to do a lot of coding. You don't just all of a sudden get good at coding. The, the way you learn to code is you actually code. Sorry, I sound a bit like anger, angry or something, but I, I don't know. Like, don't waste your time with copy pasting. Put the work in. Let's go ahead and, uh, oh, well, while I'm here, let's go ahead and talk about this. This course, another key aspect of this course is communication. And in particular, I would say this time the emphasis is really on written communication. There's an awful lot of writing that you're gonna have to do as part of this course. You'll be doing writing for uh, tutorial assignments that are gonna happen every Friday. You'll be doing writing for the weekly assignments that you'll be coding a lot in, but then you'll also be writing uh, answers to prompts inside of these weekly assignments as well. That'll be happening like say Tuesday to Thursday. Question here. We'll have rubrics attached to uh, the tutorial assignment. And what they're gonna say is, there's like two dimensions to it. There's your correctness on the topic matter, and then kind of your understandability. Even if you're wrong, are you writing in a way that I can understand what you're trying to say? 
Yeah, so I would say the logical side somehow doesn't have to do with the correctness necessarily, but like it's, like it's just, in a, like I can understand you in this conversation, it needs to be like relatively legible and understandable. That's like about like half of the mark. And then the other half will be an assessment of like, but do you know, actually know what you're talking about? Um, the, we do have TA eyes on certain writing assignments, um, but there will, it is kind of minimal feedback but hopefully you'll be getting some amount of feedback, which should at least be something approaching like a thumbs up, thumbs down, needs work, or this is looking pretty good. If you find yourself in the needs work category uh, because maybe English is a second language or something like that, I know you're very busy and you have a lot of classes, but English is a really valuable skill. Like you could say data science and statistics are a really valuable skill, or programming in Python is a really valuable skill. No doubt, so is English. Because that means that you open up a lot of jobs in the English-speaking world. Um, I don't think, and I certainly hope, there's not a heavy prejudice against people with accents. However, it can be hard to communicate. And just imagine a professional like interview situation where many people are getting interviewed, um, and you've got people with different levels of understandability on the basis of their communication. Like It's not a racist thing that people are going to prefer the better communicators. So take your time while you're here in a place like U of T where you actually have the ability to work on your English and like be really polished. I would say take that, again, I know you have a lot of classes, but why come to an English speaking university if you're not gonna try to get really good and professional with your English? And there are a lot of opportunities to try to do this. I've just got a couple here. So there is this kind of like writing center. There's a lot of writing efforts here at U of T uh, and uh, verbal and so on, all oriented around communication. If you find yourself struggling in English, which honestly, like when I look at like the performance in this class, there's a set of people who are struggling because they can't communicate in English. And that's really, that's what it comes down to. So if you, and again, you don't want to go through a university like U of T that way. I know you probably could try to get by without getting good at your English. But why come to U of T then? If you just want to work in your native language, then find a university where it's completely natural, right? If you're here, take the opportunity to work on your communication. This is a big part of what this course is. Because I imagine, you know, most of you guys are here because you're thinking, oh, it'd be kind of cool to be a data scientist or something like that. And probably maybe in the West, maybe in a place like Canada, or maybe in a place like the US. The work is going to be in English. All right. Um, so that takes us to kind of like the bottom matter of the page, all very relevant stuff, which, which is why it ends up on the home page. Um, what I want to do is I want to tell you about the cadence of the course now. Before I do, though, I will take a couple questions at this point, if there are any. Yes? So is the uh, tutorial section mandatory? The tutorial section is mandatory. If you have a problem with scheduling, you need to email the course email and see if we can work something out. Possibly we're able to. Um, in general, you should be going to your tutorial that you're assigned to. You can't be switching tutorials because we have a ded dedicated TA to each tutorial. There are, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but there's two points every Friday in tutorial. One is a tutorial activity. That's what you gotta be there in person for. And then the other is a tutorial assignment. It's probably addressed and probably like given. It's in the tutorial slide, so that probably you see it in tutorial. Uh, but that's due before the next week. So tutorial is Friday. You've got to turn that in before Monday. You'll probably finish it Friday night. But if for whatever reason you need to finish it over the weekend, that's okay too. Previously, tutorial assignments were due like 10 p.m. on Friday. So you had to do it on Friday. I've just decided TAs aren't going to be marking over the weekend anyway. So you can have the weekend to finish the tutorial assignment if you want. Tutorial assignment does not require you to have gone to tutorial. So it's a 50-50 kind of thing. Uh, but basically, I am heavily encouraging you to go to tutorial every week. And the reason I'm doing that is because we have great TAs. They are primarily fourth years and graduate students. So they have succeeded where you guys are trying to succeed. And I want them to mentor you as much as possible and show you what it's like, what it looks like to succeed. So I'm having them deliver a lot of content, a lot of review content. Tutorials are important in this class. They're an important part of this class for information dissemination. So tutorials are very important there. The other reason for tutorial, well, maybe it's kind of two. Tutorial is smaller, so you can make 
Friends Much Easier in Tutorial. It's another place where you can make a home on campus, and many people meet their very good friends, long-term friends, in tutorials. So I want you to, I'm trying to encourage through points to get you guys to go to tutorials so that you're around the same people every week. I went to a liberal arts college, so that's smaller classrooms, you know, 10 to 20 students, and I like the feel of a smaller classroom. That's what tutorials are. Tutorials are our smaller classroom where you can get more kind of hands-on attention. Sorry, let me try to get this to pop up again. Uh, I guess it'll probably jump back and forth as I keep walking around a little bit. But speaking about tutorials, before, I mean, that leads very nicely into what I want to show you guys about the cadence and structure of the course. But other questions, that was a good question. Other questions? Yes? Uh, are we using Python in this course? We're using Python, we're not using R. Um, you have a co-requisite in computer science, which is using Python. So the idea is that we are giving you a more immersive experience, a cross-course experience in Python. We hope that you will therefore get better faster at Python. This is the plan. This is very, very intentional. Also, I would just tell you that Python dominates the industry. R dominates academia. And some of you will stay in academia and be involved in research in academia, so eventually you'll want to do R. And if you take more advanced stats course, courses, they probably are not yet ported over to Python, so you'll probably be learning R. The thing is, once you know a language well, like if you can program in Python, it's not a big deal. You will come to find to translate into another language. I don't mean you're going to be a professional programmer in every single language and all of a sudden you're writing production line Java code. I don't mean that. I just mean you're going to understand that you can move between languages pretty comfortably, pretty reasonably, get some kind of things done. So it, honestly, it doesn't matter what language you're learning, just learn it well. So much of the programming language stuff is translatable. It's going to port into new languages and so on. Um, I see you. I'm coming there. I want to see if I... I just want to also comment, though, that, yeah, data, data science industry is just dominated with Python. I don't know if it's like 90-10 or something like that, but it's not even close. Um, so for data science, Python is the right language. And anything that you want to do in R, you can probably do in Python. That's my take. So I prefer Python to R, even though I'm a statistician. Yes? You mentioned co-requisite earlier, so is Math 137 okay instead of uh, computer science? Um, I'm doing computer science. So you don't have a computer science? Then you have the math co-rec? Well, you'll be Python, you'll be going at more Python alone, so you won't have the Python crossover. But if you're enrolled in the course, you're good for, for co -recs. Yeah. Yes? Where office hours start this week. They start at 5 o'clock tonight. They're online. We have both online and in-person office hours, and we also have dedicated coding office hours, many of them every week, actually eight hours of dedicated coding. If you're new to coding, office hours start this week. You should be going to office hours right now and being like, I'm new to coding. Help me get started. So, if, so for people who are newer to coding, actually things start faster for you here because this is the week where you can quickly get yourself a little bit more comfortable as you start to kind of learn. And then if you are newer to coding, you're going to be a, a mainstay feature at coding office hour. You're going to need to go to coding office hour weekly. You're going to need to be working on coding most of the time. If you do have that computer science co-rec, then you're doing a lot of coding anyway. But like, if you're not in that situation, then hopefully the office hours are here to help you. And um, I think that that should be sufficient. Yeah. All right, I don't see any more hands up, so I won't request any more questions, but certainly we'll have more opportunity for questions here. So here you are, you've made it to lecture on Monday. So either you're in the morning lecture, 9 to 11, or you're in the afternoon lecture. Oh. Or, or you're in the afternoon lecture, one to three, you can come to any lecture that you want as long as there's a seat for you. And I think there will be. As the semester goes on, I think that the, there will be a seat. And, oh, it's finally reading now. We're recording. We're live now. We've been recording. It looks like it's been recording since 9.10, which is, I guess, what we should have. So it looks like we've been recording. So the lectures are also going to be recorded. And as long as, I've, as long as the microphone is working, and as long as the screen is connecting up here, that's the capture that you get. You'll hear voice and you'll see the screen. So uh, potentially, so if you're, missing, if you're missing class, this is okay, lecture. 
Um, if, you, if it's more convenient at another time, this is probably okay. The only thing is, I just think I can't guarantee that this is always going to work. So there's no guarantee that lectures are going to be recorded, but presumably we're trying every time, which I think is a good thing. Actually, the reason I'm doing it is not for people who are here, because I would prefer for you to come in person. I'm doing it for late arrivers. Like we'll have some late enrollments and I want to make sure that they can go back through and see all the content approximately the way you guys saw it. So they don't have a terrible like disadvantage starting. So that's the Monday slot. Um, I actually, I don't remember. It's possible that office hours are five to eight. Let's see. So here I say five to eight. Let me go look at the syllabus. I'm going to cheat quickly and I want to just go look at the syllabus and see what I say in the syllabus about office hours. Office hours. Oh shoot, here I say four to seven. This is, oh no, I think this is not specific enough actually. Yeah, I think, okay, I think the syllabus is not specific enough. So I think we need to, because I tried to make it general and then we're scheduling a lot of TAs. So for office hours, you need to trust Quirkus, and it feels different than what I initially said, five to seven. Here it's saying five to eight. So right now you trust Quirkus, and it says five to eight. Now I can actually check this because I have the schedule here. Let's have a look. I know why I did that. I, I remember now. It is five to eight. However, online office hours are five to seven, and then uh, Tim, is holding our first coding office hours from six to eight. So that's correct, actually. If we go to, if I go back to the Quirkus page, where are you, Quirkus? So that's correct. We do have office hours from five to eight. But the way they're working is, okay, so everything is correct here. That's good. So the syllabus is not specific enough. Here is where we're precise on the office hours. Let me finish this and I'll come right to you. Um, so five to seven, online office hours today. This would be help. You can ask for help from coding there, of course, um, but maybe also help navigating our tools, like how do I submit on Marcus? How do I download the files? What's going on in this course generally? The, these just general office hours online, five to seven. Um, and then also on Monday here, Monday six to eight, also online is a session dedicated to coding. So someone will be there specifically to try to help guide coding issues. Yes. Okay, there I have it correct. Okay. Yeah, okay, so a little bit later, I guess I put the office hours in the syllabus. Um, this is good. That means I'm keeping things organized. The Quirkus listing is the up-to-date version of what we, keep, keep, what we think scheduling is. I did try to make it like correct in the syllabus, but the Quirkus homepage is where office hours are scheduled. And also, if, if a TA is going to be unavailable, there's going to be an announcement about that. So unfortunately, it probably will be the case that we're going to have a TA get sick from time to time or be unable to make their assigned office hour slot. So you might arrive on a line, be like, here, I'm at the Zoom link. The, the site lists that we should be having office hours, and there's no one there. If you wait for five or 10 minutes and the TA is not showing up, just let the course email know. But you'll have to then find another time. Hopefully, we won't have too many drops like that. Generally, we don't have too many missed coverages like that. But if that happens, just let us know quickly so we can try to figure out what's happening on our, our end. Broadly speaking, though, this is what the office hour is looking like. Yeah. Um, and in my pages, uh, it says um, office hour in person. The location is TBA. Ah, uh, yes. So there's three kinds of office hours. There is online office hours. There are in-person office hours in Sydney Smith, room 621, if you prefer an in-person style. We have nine office hours per week in person, or sorry, online is nine hours. Seven hours is in person in Sydney Smith. And then additionally, we have the coding uh, office hours. The coding office hours, we have not yet figured out what the room is going to be for those. That's why the coding office hours are to be announced. Um, but we'll let you guys know as soon as we have that. If we don't have a room for, for and so there's four TAs doing coding office hours. Two of them are online at the times that are listed here where, the, where it's highlighted, and two of them are in person. We don't have the in-person rooms yet, but we should have them soon. 
if for some reason the in-person coding office hours are failing, like we can't get in person or something like that, we might bump them for, uh, on any given week to be an online version. So I don't know if we'll have the rooms booked in time. If that's the case, we would just have it be an online this time. So it wouldn't be an in-person coding office hour, unfortunately, this time. I, I don't know if we'll get the rooms booked or not. Um, but then we just move online. So these, uh, the links next to those two are the backups in case in-person doesn't work on any given week for whatever reason. Oh, I don't know, maybe there's a blizzard outside or something like that. Yes? Um, I just wanted to ask, besides office hours, are better dedicated to coding or for those who are new to coding, what else do you think we can do in terms of learning coding? Like in YouTube channels? That you like? So we're learning Python, and Python is super, super duper well supported. Um, we're not going super deep into Python, but I don't have specific recommendations for you, but honestly, Google like learn Python and anything is fine and you shouldn't have to pay for it. Uh, Python is a really valuable skill the same way like speaking English is a really valuable skill. Uh, statisticians have been slower to care about coding so much. I'm not sure about mathematicians, maybe even even slower, I'm not sure. But for applied work these days, coding, coding is where it starts. It's great to be very strong at math so that you can kind of understand the theory in the background, but you just can't do modern data analysis on a piece of paper or on a chalkboard. You don't do it there anymore. You do it by coding up algorithms and so on. Question way in the back. Yes, sir. Um, I didn't fully understand the options, but we're going to be on Jupyter Hub, so you just need to be able to log into a cloud notebook. Does that answer your question? Yes. I think Yeah, we won't be using IDEs. I wouldn't even recommend it. Now, if you guys are comp sci guys and you, are, you have your favorite way that you work and so on, of course you can. We're not supporting anything except working in a notebook on Jupyter Hub. Okay. Yeah. But it's a, good, it's a fine question. But I just think we'll have many newer, newer to coding people in the course. So just easy interface, just notebook cells. Thanks for all the questions. So Monday's lectures, and from 5 to 8 today, if there's questions, we have office hours, online office hours from 5 to 7. If you're new to coding, hopefully you're free from 6 to 8 tonight. Go see if you can get a, lex a lesson, a free lesson from a uh, master's tonight. It's a statistics master's student. Um, so see if you can get a lesson from him in, uh, in Python. He was an excellent student in my statistical computation class, fourth year student, like one of my top students, has been a TA in SAT 130. Anyways, very good. You're going to be able to get a very good lesson in Python uh, from Tim, six to eight today online if you like. So that will take us through Monday. You do have access to your homework. So let me go ahead and click that. So how's homework work? Uh, let me see. Has this one started yet? Okay. Let me try from here. Weekly homework. Begin weekly homework. This is due Thursdays at 5 p.m. It's not Thursdays at 6 p.m. It's not Thursdays at 10 p.m. It's not Fridays. It's not next week. You have your homework available today and it's due Thursday. So you're done with this. You're done with your homework before you go to tutorial. That's the point. I want you done with your homework so that when you go to tutorial, we can build off of what you've been doing in your homework. So every Thursday, homework is due at 5 p.m. So how does this work? So you click on weekly homework. And let's see, this is going to load. I'm going to give it a little bit of time. We'll see if we can load here. OK, this is working all right. This is taking you to what's called a GitHub repository. Um, the course, all the course content, except for the exams, of course, um, and the answers to the automated homework testing that you're doing is available on the course GitHub. If you're a computer science guy, like I suspect these folks in the back were, then you're going to be very familiar with working with Git and eventually working with GitHub, uh, which is like the web place that Git stores stuff. But this is a version control kind of thing. It's for software project development management. That's what Git is for. Um, and so, of course, this is where I'm building all the content for my course. That link that I clicked, that was on just right on the home page, on the homework, that's taking us right here to this open flat file structure of a bunch of homeworks. I guess there's nine. OK, so all the homeworks are here and they're available. I will be reviewing and finalizing the homework over the weekend. So that's what I did. So homework one is definitely ready as I finish that over the weekend. 
So you're good to go on homework one. So let's say you want to start homework one. What do we do here? Uh, let's see, let's click it. Okay, and then there's this download button. So let's do that. Let's download that. Okay, so now I've got this uh, file here. I've got this homework one file. So now what I do, now what you've got to do is you've got to go to Jupyter Hub. So this was the question. There's a question about IDE. This is like a, called an integrated developer's environment or something like that, but coders like it because it's, it's like a place to all the type of coding and all the types of things that they need to do with coding. Um, you can do it from inside of this IDE. That's why it's called integrated, brings everything together. Um, but for us, we're not being fancy like that. We're being super simple and easy. Just go to Jupyter Hub. Okay, so let me go ahead and open up that. All right, I gotta log in. Let's see if I can do that. Okay, I've, you've got some choices here. Jupyter Notebook, R Studio, Jupyter Lab. We want Jupyter Notebook. That's the one that I clicked. Oh, here's my reminder again. Yes, it is kind of annoying to click this every time, but it's all part of the mentality of like what you're doing. And I'm not being distracted unless I say I'm gonna go do that work. So that's what that's about. Um, okay, let's try to log in here. Okay, so like once again, I've got this all password saved for me. So that's good. So hopefully you guys are like that too. Hopefully we're logging into Jupyter Hub at this point. So this, that is the workflow. You click the link on the Quirkus page, you download. You just, like, I'm gonna need you guys to remember like what homework we're on. So, but that'll be easy enough to do. So download the week that we're on, whatever homework number we're on. And then you're gonna upload that to Jupyter Hub. And this is like slow, but it's only because we're in a classroom. These classrooms just have very, very slow kind of internet. Um, you might not be able to access Jupyter Hub while you are in class. I'm going to have be accessing Jupyter Hub, or I'll be working on my local Jupyter notebook and doing my coding there. You will want to bring your computers. You probably will want to try to type and keep along, although I'm not going to stop and go slow for people to catch up to the coding that I'm doing. Try to keep up as much as you can, and then ideally we have the recordings. So if you want to go back, you'll be able to then see the recording and see what I'm typing. And at the end of the lecture, you'll have the notebook that I wrote up in the lecture. So then you'll have the actual code, the exact code that I wrote in class. So I think this is okay. I do think though that like coding along is a good idea. You might not be able to do it with Jupyter Hub. I'm not gonna try to support you getting your own local like Conda Jupyter installation, but you would be able to have a local Jupyter notebook set up the way I have if you want. So that would be something to look into. But you wouldn't have to necessarily code inside of a Jupyter notebook. If you were just sitting in class trying to code along with me, just open up any text file. Just code along in the text file. Later you can copy that into Jupyter notebook if you want. So you'll have to think about like, if you're trying to follow along in class with the coding that I'm doing, you'll have to think about how would you actually code along live. And there might be something that's a little bit extra for you because it's likely the case that it'll be hard for everybody to access Jupyter Notebooks while you're here. However, who has gotten access? Who is on Jupyter right now? So that's awesome. Like if, if you guys are not experiencing any lag issues and you can actually use it, then that's, that's what you should do. So hopefully that'll hold. I just can't promise the way the internet works here. Question here or no? Just, okay, good, good. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep going because so far it's pretty easy. You just go to the Quirkus homepage. You just click on the homework. Then you just, uh, that takes you here. You click on the one you want, you download. Now you go to Quirkus, or sorry, not Quirkus, Jupyter Hub. And so let me go ahead and upload this. So what you should do is, here's a little button. Sorry, it's really small. So let me see, can I make this a little bit bigger? That's a little bit better. Let's try that. Okay, so here's an upload button. And I just downloaded what I wanted there. So let's upload that. There it is. Okay, gotta click upload a million times. Hey, you already have it, you wanna replace it? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I wanna replace it. All right, now I gotta find it again. So I have a certain like hierarchy of folders here. You guys will probably want to do something like that to manage your files so you can find things pretty easily. Because like this is a perfect example. Right now I got to go try to find that thing I just downloaded. STA and it was called homework. So I feel like we're going to keep going. Homework, 
one there. Oh yeah, that's it. Seconds ago I uploaded it. All right, let me click it. And we'll just wait patiently a little bit. And as this loads, I actually know there was one student who already finished this, like last week I looked. So maybe some of you actually have already finished this homework assignment, uh, and that's great if so. But otherwise, the plan would generally be like, I, I wouldn't think you guys would start Monday. Like I think you'd probably have lecture today, and you probably wouldn't start on the homework right away on Monday, but you might. But for sure, you should be starting by Tuesday. And you should be finishing things up on Wednesday. And for sure, you've got to be done on Thursday. And why is that? When does it do? What time zone? Eastern time zone here. 5 p.m. Exactly. So you've got to be finishing these things up. Um, this first assignment, sh well, if you're new to coding, it's going to take you time. Generally, it's a pretty easy assignment. As the semester gets on, the assignments are going to get bigger and there's going to be more to do. So the workload will increase. But the idea right now is as you get used to these systems, maybe it's a little bit less demand on the workload. But you're going to start doing some uh, programming straight away. That's going to be due 5 p.m. Thursday, this time, our time. Um, OK, still not loading. To me, that's a, that's a lag issue with the fact that we've got a lot of people trying to like access um, in this room. Um, and I think I, I just have to wait, honestly. I don't want to, well, I could go ahead and probably just fire this up locally. Let me go ahead and just try to do that. So maybe that will load in the meantime, but let me just save this. Let me, so if you had a local Jupyter Hub, you could be doing what I'm doing. I would just kill this process that I've got. I will navigate a little bit. Uh, let's go into the homework. Here is the homework. So I can type Jupyter Notebook. And let's launch that up. So this is me being local here. OK, what's the problem here? Oh, got to give it the full file name. That would help. OK, so, so I can do this because I'm local. So you, you guys might want to look into doing this. So I'm not sure what the right size is for like when, we, when, we, when I actually start coding. I don't know. Probably we'll do something like that. Maybe a little bit bigger. So if you're all the way in the back and you can't see this, then you won't be able to tell what I'm typing. And if that's fine with you, that's totally fine. But that's, that's kind of like where it's at. So like you might want to think about moving forward if you want a clear kind of view of the screen. So anyway, you're going to be working through uh, this kind of a notebook. We will take a little bit of a break here. But um, well, you know what? Let's go ahead and do that now. So let's just take a seven minute break. And uh, we'll start in right here on how to like save this and upload it for marking and so on. So it's 10.08. I want to start again at 10.15. But just a quick, quick little break. I do think that's enough time to like run to the bathroom and run back if you want. So we'll start up again at 10.15 and then we'll go all the way to 11 and that's when we'll end.
Start up again. Starting up again, starting up again. Uh, I know there was a few people that opportunistically came down and tried to get a quick question in and I told them to wait, but find me after class if we need more questions, I'm sorry. Um, but I do wanna make sure that we can talk about like the most pertinent, relevant things while everybody is here in class. Um, it is my expectation that you all will have read the syllabus and be familiar with the syllabus. So everything that we're talking about today in this class is about the syllabus, so you can get all the information there. But it doesn't hurt to just kind of like describe things verbally a little bit more, especially this process stuff, um, which I guess isn't quite in the syllabus. So let's say I'm working on my homework, and let's say I finished it. So I make some changes, like, uh, like what do I do here? Let's see, I'm doing some work. Where do I finally make some changes? Okay, let's say I think I know the answer to this question. Okay, I think it's A. All right, so I'm doing, okay, so I like did a little work and I think I'm good to go. So now what you've got to do is you've got to download this. Uh, by the way, there were two technical issues that came up during the break. One is that sometimes the notebook when downloaded gets like STA 130 homework one dot IPYNB, which stands for IPython notebook. It's a sensible name, IPYNB. But then some people uh, on like different Surface tablets or something, when they downloaded it, it added another extension, .txt. That's fine. What you do is you upload it to JupyterHub anyway, and this was the other technical thing that came up. You guys aren't downloading any software right now. We're working in the cloud. You go to JupyterHub, U of T JupyterHub, your terminal is an interface onto the computing resources hosted in the cloud at U of T JupyterHub. You're not downloading anything programmatic or software-like on your computer. You're only downloading the homework notebook so that you can upload it to the place where the computation happens in the cloud. That's the Jupyter Hub link, which is on the course homepage. So just to go through that one more time. So you go to this link to download the homework file you're working on, and then you go to this link to get to Jupyter Hub, and then you upload your downloaded homework to Jupyter Hub, which is what we did uh, previously, and let's see if it's working now. Actually here, I'm on JupyterHub now and it's working, so it took a while for me to load. So I was there working on my local notebook, but let me go ahead and do this here. Um, so let's see, I had been very confident that the answer was A. So I was putting A in like that. And I don't, I'm, uh, I don't wanna do any more work because I'm out of time, I got too many classes, but hey, I'll answer one of 10 questions, that's pretty good, that shows that I'm giving some effort in the class. So that's all I'm gonna do, and I, and I need to download this, so what you do is you, well, there should be a download button, let me find it. Download as, and what should I download this as? Any guesses? Should I download it as a notebook.ipynb? Yeah, because that's the type of file it is. So let's download it exactly according to the type of file it is. Sorry it's annoying you have to do that, but just download the notebook. You uploaded a notebook. If you had .txt, you remove the .txt. Now it's the notebook again. So I download this. Okay, there it goes. Bam, that's downloaded. All right, so now what do I do? I, I'm a great student, and I finished my homework even before the first lecture was done. So the next thing to do is to send this off to Marcus. So I click this link. Marcus as well is a cloud resource. So click the link to Marcus. And, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and log in as me. You guys would just do the same thing, just log in as you. And um, let's see, did I hit login? Okay, so this is gonna take a little bit of time. I'm gonna emulate like a student, I'm gonna change over to be a student account once this loads uh, in a moment. Um, well, okay, there we go. So you actually, if you're in a computer science class using Marcus, you probably have some more choices here. But if this is the only class that you have with Marcus, then you probably just have this choice. So you just click in. Now this is me, but let me, um, let me first see if I can make a, let me make a fake user real quick. You guys don't make a fake user, you just log in as yourself, but I just wanna make a fake user. So if I go to users, maybe I shouldn't have tried to do that. Well, it depends how slow this thing is. No, it looks like, if, as long as this loads pretty quickly, I'll make a quick little user. Okay, that's good. So let me make a, let me make a add a student. Let me make a, uh, let me call this student three test. Okay, cool. So, 
I think that student is there. So I'm going to now pretend that I'm that student. So I'll roll switch as three test. So your screen should look like that, actually, as a student. So you don't see all the tabs and all the control stuff that I have. That's for automating the homework grading. Not all of it. Some of it, the TAs are marking specific questions, but it'll tell you exactly which ones the TAs are exactly looking at. And then it'll tell you which ones are being automatically graded by Marcus, which is why you've got to go through this whole rigmarole of saving the file from the Jupyter Notebooks, from Jupyter Hub, and then uploading it to Marcus. So that's what we're doing right now. So we've logged into Marcus. This is due. Um, I go to the submissions tab. And now I've got to upload, whenever this loads for me, I'm going to upload my notebook file. Now, any of this process that I'm doing, I know I'm going fast. I just like, want to demonstrate it for you, but that's why we have office hours. So if you need help remembering how to do this process, just check in with office hours real quick. As the semester rolls on, you'll get comfortable with this. Just a kind of series of steps. Of course, most of your time is going to be doing the homework Anyway, this is just like the, the final stuff that you need to do. Okay, so it tells me I require a file that's missing. Well, I want to submit a file. So I click the Submit button. Now I've got to go find that file that I made, which I don't know which one it is. That's today at 1021. That must be it. Let's upload that. This has the wrong name. Marcus won't work. Because if you look here, I know it's grayed out, but it tells you the name of the file that you must have. If your file doesn't have the name that Marcus is expecting, then you might as well not have submitted a file. So I've got to make sure that the file is named as requested. The file's naming that's requested is what I've named the files. <laughs> so it should be pretty easy for you to save the files with the right name and, and load them. But if for whatever reason you're getting a different file name, like maybe you just decide you want to use a slightly different name on your file for your own filing organization, that's fine. Just use this little thing where I can change the file name. So that's what I'm going to do. Rename the file to, and look, it clicks down with the name that I want. You don't even have to try. So please don't put the wrong name files up there. It's like so hard to put the wrongly named files, and yet students have managed to do that. So anyway, just please rename the file to what it's supposed to be named, because my file got downloaded with an extension, because apparently I already had one. I didn't want to overwrite it. And there we go. Oh. The way these work is your notebook is a sequence of code that runs top to bottom. If your notebook doesn't run top to bottom without error, the code is breaking, you're going to be missing Marcus auto tests. You've got to validate that your code is working, which is really easy to do. Actually, I can go back here to this. You can go to kernel. Let me make this a little bit bigger. OK, this is big enough. You can go to kernel, and you can click restart and run all. That kills the Python process, starts it again, and then runs your notebook top to bottom. Now you just scroll through and make sure that there were no coding errors. Because if there's a coding error, Marcus is going to see that, and it's going to auto-fail any number of the automated tests. And I'm not going to feel bad for you. You're going to miss those points because your code didn't run. That's why. And you could say, oh, but look, all my code down here is correct, and there was just an error up there. Marcus doesn't know how to handle errors. Your notebook should run from top to bottom. So you've got to make sure that your notebook runs from top to bottom. So that's how you do it. You go kernel run all once you're all done. Just make sure you don't have any variables that are all of a sudden getting used that weren't defined or something like that. That's the only downside of these notebooks. Maybe IDE people disagree. Maybe IDE, maybe IDE people like have all kinds of problems with notebooks. But the major risk of notebooks is that you can write code here, and then you could like put code on the top that use the code down here, but it's not sequential, right? Like You could run this cell, and then you could go up, and you could run a different cell. That's how these notebooks work. You'll get very familiar with this. And so you could have your code be out of sequence. As a user in the notebook, you think it's working, because you ran the cell, and then you ran the cell up above, and then it worked. But if the, the cell up above requires that the cell down below gets run first, and you run your notebook top to bottom, of course the cell at the bottom didn't get run before the cell up above, right? And that would cause a failure in your notebook. So your notebook's got to run top to bottom. Otherwise, you're going to end up uh, with Marcus auto fails, and you're losing points on the homework um, unnecessarily. So that's what I would do to check it. I would go to the kernel, restart, and run all. Um, at any rate, you could just double check after you're happy that your notebook is working. You can click here, and you can actually like visualize. I guess, it'll, OK, so there we go. You can just like double check that. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is everything. 
this is everything, I, it's good. And now here's the point. We have a lot of TAs in this class and they're working you know, like 10 hours a week, they're working a lot, but certainly we have too many students for the TAs to actually be carefully evaluating all the code that you guys are submitting. So that's what the Marcus is for. It's for automating the code evaluation. And that is your responsibility for the most part. On a given homework, there's gonna be a few problems where, the TA, where it says TAs evaluate these questions manually. So they're gonna either go in and look at what you've written or go in and look at your code. But for the most part, all their questions are automatically uh, marked. And so what you do then is you go here to automated testing and you can run all the tests on which your mark is based. You have access to everything. There's no reason not to be submitting perfect notebooks unless in the event that you run out of time. I mean, we're not hiding the answers from you. If you, if you want to submit a notebook that's wrong and see all the answers and just populate all the answers in, you could do that. Not a great learning strategy. Point being, the evaluation of the code is your responsibility you should take advantage of the fact that we're exposing the automated testing so that you can see how you're doing. So that's what I would do. I would here click run tests. And this is just gonna take a little while. Different notebooks might take longer depending on how much code is actually running. But by and large, these things run very fast because code runs very fast. But uh, you gotta refresh. It doesn't like tell you when it's done. But let me try to refresh that. It's done. Oh, it's not done. So it's been queued and it's still working, but right now it's still in progress. So we'll wait a little bit more. We'll be a little bit more patient. And I know I'm a good student because I turned this in early and I was pretty sure about that answer A. Oh, shoot, okay. <laughs> Apparently I failed them all. Well, why, why did I fail them? Oh, I failed them because it wasn't A, it was C. So, so sometimes the feedback is that simple, but sometimes the feedback is more of a hint. But we have tried to provide very useful feedback for you We've, I don't want to say that too strong. We've tried to provide enough that if you look at the error output, it should help you think about why you're failing the auto test. If you think there's problems with Marcus, there's a special on Piazza. I haven't mentioned Piazza yet, but you can, okay, so we have all our office hours. We have online office hours, in-person office hours. We have specially coding dedicated office hours. We also have a course discussion board, Piazza. I'll show you that on the course homepage in just a second here. Um, if you think there's problems with Marcus, like the testing is not working right, there's a special issue, like a special folder or issue or whatever for Piazza, um, and I watch that closely. So if you really think there's problems with Marcus, then I will see it and I'll try to figure out whatever is happening with Marcus. But mostly Marcus should be good to go. You should be getting useful feedback for anything that's wrong. And ideally, you won't be seeing a screen like this Instead, let me cancel this roll switch. Let me do a new roll switch. Let me roll switch, I think, as this user. Okay, so I'm pretending I'm a different student now. And let's see, let's go to this homework and let's go to their submissions. And they have submitted the right file. And uh, that's what that should be looking like. So they got that all right. Um, if it's all correct, there's nothing to click. You get no feedback. So if you want to see the feedback for some reason, you'll have to first submit a failing notebook. You make your notebook fail on purpose. It doesn't matter how many times you fail. You can resubmit this as many times as you want. You can run it as many times as you want. The only thing that matters is on Thursday, 5 p.m., when we officially run it, at that time, now it matters how well you're scoring on all these things. So if you really wanted to like see hints you don't just want to get the right answer and feel like you were guessing, but you want to see the feedback. You'll have to do that yourself manually by entering wrong answers and then eventually make sure you correct that and put the right answers in. Okay, but that's Marcus. And you'll be doing that every week. There'll be nine times that you're doing that. The duration, the amount of content is going to get more and more and more. The assignments are going to get bigger and bigger as we get on into the semester. But that's okay because hopefully you're improving uh, by this time as we go along. I see a question there, and we should generally stop for questions. I've been going for a while. Yes, sir. So, um, you can see the uh, testing Oh, you haven't even submitted. This, all they've done is uploaded, and you can run automated tests as soon as you've uploaded. 
your submission finally happens automatically at 5 p.m. You don't have to do anything. We collect anything that has been uploaded at that time. Yeah, immediately. If you upload and you click run, just like I did, you'll immediately see the feedback. And you'll see that before Thursday. So, you know, really the only reason you should be missing anything is if you run out of time and you just don't prioritize adjusting. Um, if you go to Quirkus and you look at the way the rubric for the homework assignments works, you can see how the TAs actually grade this. So it's not, it's even gentler than just like, that's 100% green, so you get one mark. It's even gentler than that. Basically, we just want to see that you're putting in good effort for the most part. So you don't have to get everything perfect, and you could still get a pretty good mark. You just have to put a decent effort in that we can tell, yeah, they're working through this notebook pretty well. And we can Yep, you'll have to overwrite. You'll overwrite it each time as many times as you want. You can run the test as many times as you want. The only reason you wouldn't be able to is if it's like if Marcus is like goes service outage or something like that. Yep. And was that your question? Yeah. As many times as you want. Yes. Uh, you can try that. That functionality is not, not, I'm told it's not reliable. But if that works for you, go for it. I'm not putting that in the class because I was told by the Jupyter people, actually the Marcus people, they're like, I don't know, I don't know how that connection is working. I know that they constantly are updating Marcus, so like maybe it's good to go now. Uh, but for me, I say the process I have. Download, upload to Jupyter Hub, finish, download, upload to Marcus. But if you've got a better way, do it. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, I'm also pleased for no more questions because I want to keep trying to kind of like orient you to the course generally. So those are the main tools. Quirkus takes you to GitHub, gets you files, takes you to Jupyter Notebook where you finish your files, you download from Jupyter Notebook, then you upload your files to Marcus. So that's the flow. One more thing, I didn't click this link, but that homework one has a data set attached to it. You'll need to download that data set and also upload it to uh, Jupyter Hub. So here's a link for data sets. So I click that and give it a little time. And you can download these data sets in the same way as you download the Jupyter Hub file. So since we're here, let's go ahead and take the time to do this. So this was me working. So I need a file called coffee ratings. So for example, if I well, let's just do a little bit of coding here, just a itty bitty bit. Let me try to run the cell. Download my coffee ratings file. Do it for me, do it for me now. Give me my coffee ratings. Come on, come on, come on. Well, the first thing that's gonna happen is I don't have the pandas library. So assuming I can get some kind of live connection here, which maybe I can't, I'll get an error. The reason I wanted to do that was to demonstrate for you guys that like you don't want an error like this in your code. Let me try here. Uh, there. Okay, I'll get that kind of an error. It doesn't know about that. Actually, that one's even wrong. So I'd have to fix this. Let's fix this. Let's comment that out. Oh, whoa. Let's fix this. This is supposed to be pandas, but that's still not going to run because I don't have pandas, so I need to import it. Import pandas as pd. All right, now that should be pretty good to go. Um, it's taking a while. This is local on my local machine, so this won't take too long, but it's trying to get pandas. Um, I have no idea why, okay, there we go. Okay, I still have an error. Well, that error is saying I don't know what this file is. Da -da 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 a lot of stuff, no such file. Okay, so I need that file. This is the type of error that I'm talking about. You can't have this kind of error in your notebook. Your notebook needs to run top to bottom without an error like this. An error like this breaks all your testing on Marcus. Marcus doesn't know what to do with coding errors. Um, so in this, so, so Jupyter Hub, I'm working here in Jupyter Hub, it's too slow. So it strikes me like, like this is probably not gonna be, Jupyter Hub is probably not gonna be reliable for, your, for kind of coding along in class. But any text file just locally on your computer is fine. And if you wanna feel a little bit advanced, you could look into trying to install uh, Jupyter Notebooks or Jupyter Hub on your machine. That's not supported by class. It's almost even not recommended, but if you wanna try, you're welcome to try. But any kind of text file for writing code will work just fine for the purpose of taking notes. So what I need to do here, so let's pretend Jupyter Hub is working all fast and fine the way it will as soon as you like leave the confines of this room. Um, I would wanna get rid of this error. So what I need to do is download the coffee data. Is this where I'm working? 
here. That's, 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 that's. There we go. Sorry, that's the tab. That's the tab I clicked from Quirkus to get to the data sets. That tab was right there, data sets. I clicked that, took me here. I want the coffee data set. Let's find it. Coffee ratings. Okay, let's click that. Uh, here, I download it. That's in my downloads. It's right. I would need to put this where my, I would need to put this in a way that my homework file knows where it is. So for me, this is like, I think it's going to be a little bit complicated. My homework file is in this interesting directory. I should just put it next to my homework file. That's what I should really do here. So that's what I'm going to do. So let me go, well, let me double check that. The reason it should go next to my homework file is because it's saying get this file named this. And because there's no directory path structure saying where is this file, this is saying the file is just right here, like right next to me. is a file named coffee ratings, so go get that. And where is me? Well, me is where my notebook is running from. So for you, your notebook would be just running from probably base Jupyter Hub. You would have just uploaded it to Jupyter Hub, so you should just upload the data there, and everything would work fine. For me, I need to make sure that I put it in the right file place, so let me go ahead and do that. Let's go out of that. Let's go into... Let's go into that. Okay, this is just doing bash command line coding stuff. This is what happens as you like eventually get advanced into tech. An operating system doesn't matter anymore. You just are working in kind of command line interfaces like this. Let's go to the homework. All right, this is where I want to put this. So I grab this, put it here. Let's just move it there. Okay, so now the homework is sitting right next to where this notebook is running. So now I should be able to run this. Okay, and I'm good. Um, I just demonstrated that for two purposes. Just like you've got to go collect the data sometimes. So that's where the data is. There's a link for the data. And then that showed the errors that you don't want to be having any runtime errors like that. Or it means your Marcus uh, auto grading is going to fail all your evals. All right. Let me go back now to, oh shoot, I've lost it. Well, we're going to go ahead and go here because I, I know that's where Quirkus is. So what did that do? That got us to this column here. This is available basically over the weekends, but I would say like homework's kind of available on Monday when class is. It's due Thursday, 5 p.m. Every week it's like that, unless for some reason there's something different than a, a weekly homework that week, but nine of the weeks is weekly homework. Um, you've seen all the tools, so download it from GitHub, download the files, download the data from GitHub. The links are right there on Quirkus. Upload them to JupyterHub. That's not a software thing. JupyterHub's not a software thing, it's a cloud service. So you don't download anything. You just upload your files to JupyterHub. Then you work on your notebooks on JupyterHub. You finish your notebooks on there. Then you download your notebooks, and then you upload them to Marcus. And then you can immediately run all the auto testing you want to make sure that things are good. And where you've missed problems, you'll be able to click and see what the actual feedback is. Um, I think it's an OK time to maybe talk about this. So there's also Piazza. The TAs are instructed to be answering questions from 4 to 6, Monday through Thursday. They might be able to answer earlier in the day if they've just got their app open and they're like, oh, I can answer this real quick. The reason for this is like we try to get your answers done between 4 and 6 on the day that you answered them. That's probably the time that TAs are dedicated to Piazza will be able to respond. But you guys as well could help each other. And a great way to confirm that you know something is to teach it and answer it for somebody else. So if you could help each other on Piazza as well, certainly feel free uh, to do so. It's not the worst use of your time. Um, so that's how Piazza is kind of working. Again, I said, like, if there's Marcus issues, put them on Piazza, because that's what I'll be monitoring in case for some reason the Marcus tech is breaking and not working right. I want to know as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, all kinds of questions answerable on Piazza. Uh, we have already talked about office hours, but I'll walk you through it here again. So in-person office hours on Tuesdays from 11 to 12, that's in, do you guys remember what room that's in? Sydney Smith 621. There's also other help desks, statistics help desks that as well could help you. I don't actually remember what they're called. Um, you'd have to look on the, on the syllabus for one of them. I don't know, there's, there's two other programs that offer stats tutorial support, office hour support. 
You're welcome to use those. The thing is, they're not RTAs. So like no promises on if they can help you. It's probably best to use RTAs. RTAs are more familiar with the course. And, and as you're going to see, we have a lot of office hours. So I don't really see there being like, a, oh, there's not enough office hours. There's no office hours provided. If it's really true, if it's really the case that like there's not enough office hours to support all the need from students coming to office hours, we will try to address that. But like right now, I don't see that happening. There's a lot of office hours to go to. If you want to go to the in-person office hours, that's Sydney Smith uh, 621, just right down the road. I actually don't know. I think it's actually out and down that way, if I remember the orientation of the building here. So just down the road here. Tuesday, 11 to 12. Tuesday, 5 to 7 p.m. in person. Wednesday, a little bit longer in the afternoon, 11 to 1, so an extra hour there. And uh, same time in the evening, 5 to 7, in person, Sydney Smith, 621. Uh, alternatively, if it's more convenient, find a good place with a steady internet connection, jump onto a Zoom call. That's the link. Oh, shoot, we don't need to go to the link right now. That will be manned by a TA during the hours that are advertised unless we've lost TA coverage. My apologies if we lose TA coverage. The TAs are not trying to skip out on office hours, so by and large, we should be good. If we think there's going to be some changes to coverage or we've dropped coverage or something like that for an office hour, we try to let you guys know. But like, we'll do the best we can there. Mostly, I think we'll do pretty well. Um, so that's Monday to 7 p.m. today. You could start. Um, 12 to 1 tomorrow. 5 to 8, so we go later on Tuesday, tomorrow being Tuesday. And then Wednesday, 11 to 12, so notice that it's slightly different. It's 12 to 1 on Tuesday. Wednesday is 11 to 12, so slightly different hours. That has to do with trying to schedule a lot of TAs to cover the office hours, so slight differences. So just watch out for those depending on which day it is. Uh, and then a slight difference here in the evening on Wednesday, 6 to 8. And that is when online office hours are held. And then additionally, we've already talked about um, coding office hours. So these are our strongest Python coder TAs, and it's not a one-hour session, it's a two-hour session. For the most part, th this week is different. They don't have any code to show you. This week, you should go, if you need to work on coding, you're new to coding, you should go and introduce yourself and say, I'm going to really be hoping to use your services. And by the way, what kind of little lesson could you tell me right now? Help me learn about Python. And what they should say is, let's go to JupyterHub. Let me start showing you some things. That's what that conversation should be like. They should just start coding up some Python examples for you. Um, that's what would happen in these coding sessions this week. In general, though, my lectures are not lectures. I'm going to code for you guys. I'm going to have an outline. I'm going to have all the things I want to demonstrate code for. I'm going to have all the terms I want to define. I'll stop. I'll define some terms. I'll tell you a few conceptual things. The thing is, I think if you understand the algorithm, if you understand the code, then you understand the concept. So that's why, why my lectures are going to be this way. We're going to have coding lectures. So I'll have done two hours of coding with you guys in my Monday lecture. And that two hours of coding will have produced a notebook special to you, the one that we made here live in class. And the TAs will have access to these, the coding TAs. So these are our good Python TAs. And their job is to help you go through the lecture coding that I did if there are questions. Did it go too fast at some point? They almost should be redoing the entire lecture. That's not, what I'm, that's not what they're told to do, but they're told you should support students understanding the code that we did in lecture. So the TA, coding TA's preparation for their coding sessions is go look at what I coded and be ready to help students with what we're coding. Uh, and that's two hours because the lecture is two hours. So these are long coding sessions. And if you, so, uh, Wow, so I, I, I try to put this gently. There's a lot of frustration uh, about that people have to learn coding as part of this class while they are also learning the statistics concepts. I agree that that's a, that's a, like we're asking a lot. We do a lot in this class. The thing is, that is how it is. This class is requiring you to learn coding. It's also requiring you to learn the concepts that we code up and that we use. So if you are at a place where uh, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm going to use you as an example just because you've been friendly with your questions, but I'm newer to Python. Tell me about some resources. How should I learn? And truly my answer is like, learn Python, Google, learn Python and whatever comes up is going to be fine. But use the office hours is my point here. Use the coding office hours. TAs cost money. I have to decide how the TA's time gets used. I'm specifically dedicating TA's to help anybody who wants to put a legitimate effort into learning how to code. 
You're paying so much money to come here to U of T. Be, like, please use this resource. It is costing U of T money. It's very valuable. These are, our TAs are very talented students. I mean, they are the best of the best. You should see the competition for TA positions for STAT 130. It's, it's bloody competitive. Everybody would like this position. It means we have a really, really strong TAs, basically, across the board. So use, use our TAs to help yourself learn. Take advantage of this. That's what, you're, that's what you're doing here. You're making yourself better by coming to university and so on. So take advantage of good things like coding sessions, learning how to, how to program in Python, and so on. So that takes us through the office hours. Um, your homework is then due on Thursday. Friday, you're going to tutorial sections. You've got to see what section you're in on ACORN. And then you got to see what room that is. Go to your tutorial section. You can't just go to any tutorial section. You've got to go to your tutorial section. While attendance in tutorial is not mandatory, there's an in-person participation point every time. So basically, unless you want to start bleeding points slowly throughout the semester, you've got to be going to tutorials. There's a tutorial assignment. You don't have to have gone to tutorial to submit that. You will have to go and upload the tutorial slides and go see what the assignment is. It'll be a written assignment for the most part. Sometimes it's a coding assignment, but most of the time it's a written assignment. And then you're submitting that through Quirkus. So you don't have to have gone to tutorial to submit the tutorial assignment, but you have to have gone to tutorial to do the tutorial activity to get that one point. Now this is going to feel off to you guys. So when is tutorial assignment due? It's due before 9 a.m. Monday. You're not going to like that as a deadline. It's like, oh my gosh, I have to wake up early at like 6 o'clock and turn this in before I go to class. Now, but like I said, in the past, tutorial assignments were due at 10 p.m. on Friday. So all we've done is just given you a little bit more time. If you want to take a little bit more time over the weekend to finish your tutorial assignment, uh, go ahead. There's a lot of work in this class because you're doing these weekly homeworks and you're doing these tutorial assignments. Um, roughly speaking, the amount of effort for the class still should be about 10 hours a week on average. So if you're newer to coding or you need additional time, you will be potentially having weeks where it's, it's more demanding and so on. I see people moving, so let's see what the time is here. We have two minutes. Oh, we're gonna keep going. We got 10 minutes, guys. We're gonna keep going. We go all the way up to 11. Um, if you did miss tutorial and uh, you still want to turn in the tutorial assignment. Hey, pipe down, guys. Please pipe down. If you are done and you need to go, you can definitely head out. But no talking here. Not in the middle of lecture. Let's go to 11 with the lecture. If you've got to leave, then you can definitely leave. OK, if you miss tutorial, uh, then you can still do the tutorial assignment. Um, and that's available here through this link. I'll click this link quickly. Actually, I'm not sure where that ended up. Okay, this link, let me just open in a new window. Uh, same story here as all the other links through GitHub. Um, and you would download the tutorial that you want. At the end of the tutorial is the assignment. Um, if, uh, if you haven't attended in person. All right. Um, let's do a quick pause for questions here. We can take as many as we want. Yes. So if uh, something serious happens and we need to do it, ah. So uh, right now, we finished this table. Below the table is uh, the syllabus. I'm going to click that. And I keep not seeing where that's opening, so I need to open it. I have too many things open. Open a new window. Um, this is taking us again to a Jupyter notebook. So what you would do is you would download the syllabus, and then you would go to Jupyter Hub, and you would upload the syllabus on Jupyter Hub. And there you would read the syllabus as a notebook. Um, I think, though, I will, just for the sake of time, I, I won't go through that process again. But it's a really good question. And I um, basically wanted like a little bit more time even to go through the syllabus. But with just 10 minutes, it's just a perfect transition into the syllabus. So
grades. And beneath grades, so I had to scroll down a bit in the syllabus to get this, but beneath grades, there is kind of all the contingencies. And I want to speak specifically about the contingencies at the moment. So there are nine weekly homeworks, and there are nine tutorial days with tutorial activities and tutorial assignments. The way the marking works is it's a best seven out of nine. So for whatever reason, I don't care what reason at all, and I don't even really want to know what reason, you can miss two tutorials, and it won't affect your bottom line mark in the sense that the other seven marks will be what counts. There's an updated uh, absence form through ACORN and an updated policy on absences. Once per term, you can uh, declare an absence for medical, emotional, etc. reasons through ACORN. This requires a certain amount of additional documentation beyond what was like done in previous semesters. And that process gets started and then you need to contact the course email sta130 at utoronto.ca. That somehow merges with this best seven of nine idea. So if you go and use up that one-time option of an absence declaration, initially it doesn't even matter to me because there's already like a best seven of nine. So I'll be like, thanks for declaring your, de your absence declaration, but it doesn't really affect us. The only time that would affect us as far as the nine weekly homeworks or the nine tutorial activity assignments, the only time that would affect us is if you had like prolonged sickness and it's like three weeks and there's like pretty legitimate reasons for why you've already missed two out of the nine, right? So potentially you could think about that absence declaration as a way to even further soften the best seven out of nine, the way the scoring works. However, I would be a little bit hesitant about that because you only have one per term that you can do that. And if you were to employ, that's kind of like next level protection. If you were to employ that, you might be more interested in employing it relative to a more heavy assignment. I wouldn't even recommend it for the midterm. So if you miss the midterm, I don't care. Those points go on the final. And now your final gets scored at like 50% of the course grade or something like that. So you don't want to miss the midterm and hopefully you don't. But if you do, the procedure is already in place. We just move your points to the final. The other thing that might be relevant is the course project. We're presenting on December 7th. That's, by the way, when the mentorship stuff is due as well. That's the end of the semester, Thursday, December 7th. Um, and there are some exceptions for being late, but they're big point deductions. You're losing over 50% if you can't present on time when the presentations are due, or you're not turning in your slides on time when the slides are due. Um, that's when, like to my view of the course, that's when this might be interesting. If you are legitimately sick around that time and it's actually affecting your ability to contribute to the course project, then that's probably when the absence declaration is the most helpful because then it becomes a conversation about the penalty. On the other hand, the group projects are pretty big. Unfortunately, we haven't had time to speak a lot about the group projects, well at all, actually. But more information on group projects later. But hopefully that's a good answer to your question about absences in general. And I would refer you to uh, this additional policies section. Guys, as you're leaving, please keep it down. I am going the full lecture until 11 o'clock. If you have to go, I definitely understand that. But we go the full lecture time here. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, the grades here. So I've alluded now to these seven points weekly homework, and then the tutorial comes with a weekly activity and weekly assignment. So that's all together 21 of the class points. There's the best seven of nine policy associated with that. Midterm exams were 24 points. Final exams were 33 points, so obviously those are a big deal. Um, the course project altogether is worth 17 points, and that happens in various ways. There's various assignments along the way, and then finally there's a presentation, and then finally there's the evaluation of your slides. So that's 17 points. I did really want to spend more time talking about the course project because you need to make your project teams by October 13th. Your project team should be made in your tutorial, so with the people in your tutorial. Your project team should be five people, potentially six people, potentially four people is how we're kind of looking at it. Big project teams. 
The reason that we're doing big project teams uh, is of course to distribute the work, but also hopefully so that if you end up with a team member who's not contributing so much, it doesn't actually affect your team's productivity. So honestly, the amount of work that exists with the course project could be assigned to three people, and we could have project teams of three people. But I'm making it bigger to five, because I, I think everybody can still contribute. It can still be a positive situation. And hopefully this like lessens the issue of a student like torpedoing your effort if it's like one of your group members just isn't contributing or something like that. Yes? So if, it's, if a group member does do that, um, will they still receive the same mark as someone else? They probably will. However, we're giving a lot of opportunities for a team to kind of unanimously agree and report to us. We're having issues getting productivity out of this person. Um, we want to provide like a little bit more help navigating issues like that if it happens. But the help in the most extreme cases, we boot the member from your group, we kick them, and then we, that's not good as far as like what their options are, but then they end up trying to figure out something on their own. So that would be like the most extreme way that we would deal with that. Um, in, emotional, interpersonal like conflict though, is like it's, it's really draining and bad, so you really want to try to work through things, and hopefully we're avoiding that. I suspect we probably are, not, uh, are up at the time at this point, so unfortunately that's all I get to say for today. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. I am going to